What's going on, y'all? KM Best here. Marvel Snap's metagame is wide open, and this might be the longest top decks video I've ever had to record because of how many decks you can play. I think the best place to start when talking about the metagame is, of course, Silky Smooth, aka Silky Smash. This is the archetypal Angela deck. It is the sort of first Angela deck that really burst onto the scene after she was reverted. It is the Angela deck that the devs called out as a deck they were thinking they could revive as they reverted Angela. And I think that generally speaking, this is sort of the baseline for the metagame. It describes a larger archetype of decks. I'm using this here to talk about all of the Angela decks in the metagame. There are going to be, I think, four or five on this tier list that we go through, and talking about each of them and their intricacies does matter, but generally talking about how the Angela decks match up into other decks in the metagame is also quite important. Silky Smooth is sort of the baseline for that. It is the one that has the mashup spread that sort of sets the tone for all the others, because fundamentally a lot of these decks are doing the same thing. They are good into, you know, random stuff, other mid-range decks, decks that are looking to play points on the board, decks that are vulnerable to whatever tech they're playing, usually Shang-Chi. Those are the things that these decks are good into. They are bad into combo decks, decks like Phoenix Force, decks like Hela, decks like Living Tribunal, decks like Mr. Negative, that just go completely over the top. Now, some of those decks can be teched against. Living Tribunal, Mr. Negative, Enchantress, Mobius, those are good cards in those matchups that you could change this deck in order to try to deal with. However, some of those decks are a lot harder to tech against. For example, Hela, there is not a one-size-fits-all solution for that. You just kind of have to accept that you're going to be in unfavorable situations against Hela gamers when you're playing a deck like this. Now, there have been some attempts to modify this core, and I think one of the major upsides of Silky Smooth is just how customizable it can be. As an example, take a look at this list that Revis cooked up. This is an attempt at making Silky Smooth have a matchup spread that is much more, if you'll pardon the pun, smooth. This deck is looking to leverage Jean Grey and Eliath inside the Silky Smooth core, so you still have all of this power because of the Angela stuff, but with Eliath, new Eliath of course, and Jean Grey, you actually just get to beat Hela. That's kind of the degree that you have to build in order to have a good matchup into Hela, and I don't even think it necessarily gives you a good matchup into Hela. I know people have been playing this in the top 50 to some success, but I'm really including it here to just give you a demonstration of just how customizable Silky Smooth really is as an archetype. It's a mid-range deck. You take pieces out, you put pieces in, you customize it to beat whatever you're going to see. If you want to beat Living Tribunal and Mr. Negative, you play Mobius and Enchantress, you don't play Shang. Things of that nature are sort of how you need to approach a deck like this. Now, I think that Silky Smooth is the baseline for the metagame, but I don't think that means it is necessarily the best choice. It is just the space from which everything else spirals outward. I think Shuri Kitty is a little bit more of a promising direction to take if you want to play one of these Angela Hope decks that doesn't instantly get run over by something like Hela. It doesn't exactly have the tools to compete with the good Mr. Negative or Living Tribunal draws, but it can deal with things like Hela and Phoenix Force in meaningful ways just by going very, very tall. I almost think that this deck is a bit of a misnomer when it's referred to as a Shuri Kitty deck, because despite my building for it by going for a Forge in here instead of, say, like a Loot Cage or a Cosmo, a defensive tech piece... It's a deck that is almost never actually shurrying the kitty, right? Like normally in other builds of this, you would be shurrying the kitty. That's how this deck used to play. I think right now, the vast majority of my shuries are going on either uh, Vision or on Red Hulk in this deck. And Red Hulk, of course, can take the shurry because you are able to play something along the lines of Hope Summers into shuri into Red Hulk, Taskmaster, and Armor in the same turn because of the way that tends to work, right? You get that extra energy, lets you play the Red Hulk early, the Red Hulk gives you extra energy, lets you play Taskmaster Armor, so your Red Hulk can't get Shang-Chi as long as you have priority. Very straightforward, very basic gameplay that just puts a ton of power onto the board. And because in matchups like Hela, you don't have to worry about getting Shanged, you can just be like, yeah, I'm going to make a 38 power Red Hulk, and then I'm going to make a 38 power Taskmaster, and you're just going to have to beat that. 
And I think that is a valuable thing to have in what is otherwise a very competent Angela, Hope, Elsa, Kitty deck. Like, that stuff can win you games too. Just being Angela, Hope, Elsa, Kitty, Vision, Red Hulk, you'll be able to win a bunch of games with those cards. And I think that is a direction that this kind of archetype can go. It's not actually that far removed from Silky Smooth. It's just like a slightly different package rotated in. And even, I do think it's a different deck, and it has different splits, different matchups, but I think it's a very, it's a compelling version of the deck. Like, if I had to play one Angela deck, I think this might be my choice. And I know people are going to be surprised because I'm not saying Loki is my choice. I think that, generally speaking, Loki is in a role of a quasi mid-range crusher, but its poor matchups into basically every combo deck really give it some trouble. This is a deck that instead of going for the Shuri stuff is going for the card Loki, which normally is a really good idea. If you want to beat up on Silky Smooth decks, this is the deck to play. It will absolutely whip the crap out of anyone trying to play a fair mid-range game. That is what the card Loki does. However, there is such a lack of fair mid-range games in the Marvel Snap metagame right now that this deck has been, in my opinion, a little bit declining. I think it's impossible for this deck to ever be, like, actually all that bad. It's just very, very good at doing what it does. It is also a good Angela deck. It has all this stuff. But if I had to guess, I think that the best Loki players in the world right now will have cut Hope Summers for Cosmo in order to have more game into those combo decks, in order to have something that, say, means you don't instantly lose to Phoenix Force. I have this list on here because it's the one that I have the most experience playing, but I do think that that is a totally reasonable cut you can make, and you should be thinking about making a cut like that in order to sort of define Loki as something other than the mid-range killer. This is still a deck that has a ton of skill expression. Cosmo adds a little bit more to that, and you're gonna need to leverage it when you play it. Concluding, I believe, our Hope, Elsa, Kitty, Angela section is this deck made by Gnome. This is a list that is doing many similar things to the other decks in here, but the main idea here is just one of the best ways to attempt to beat combo is by just making it less likely that they draw their stuff. Your tech in this deck is just putting a bunch of rocks in there, right? This is yet another attempt by the mid-range archetype to have game into these incredibly powerful and dangerous combo decks. There are a wide variety of combo decks, which is exactly, that's the next section of this video, that we're going to have to talk about, and each of them is built to crush mid-range in a unique and different way. So it's hard to have answers for all of them. This deck attempts to have answers for all of them in the sense of just saying, you're not going to draw your combo. We're going to make you less likely to draw your combo, and that's just going to be how we're going to play it. And I think that is a very fun way to approach this metagame. This deck has had some success at High Infinite. It's been pretty solid in my experience. And I think this is a good example of just the, the multitude of ways you can take the Kitty Angela Hope shell and apply it to different goals. And I think that kind of thinking is going to be what takes you to high ranks in Marvel Snap this season. Let's talk about the boogeymen. It's the combo section. In this case, we're gonna start with a boogie woman. That's Hella. This is the least interactable combo deck in the game. This is just the baseline of what we're talking about here. I, in my opinion, combo decks sort of ride a line from extremely powerful to non-interactable, right? And when a deck is both, that's a huge issue. When a deck is not the strongest combo deck and it is hard to interact with or impossible to interact with, I think that's a little bit more reasonable. My main issue with Hella as a sort of deck that exists is that there's just not really a way to build to beat it. You just have to accept that if they do their thing, you're going to die unless you switch your deck entirely, right? I have multiple decks on here that were built with the express purpose of beating Hella. You like clog them up, you play Professor X, that's stuff you can do, but it's a totally different strategy as com you have to do a totally different thing to what you were already doing. It's just a completely different deck. You can't take Silky Smooth and add a card in there to deal with this the way you can with some of the other decks. And I think there is some value in that. I can't really argue with that because Hella is, in my opinion, perhaps the lowest point output of the major combo decks. So it does make sense that it would be the hardest to interact with. In fact, 
the other combo decks that have higher output exist mostly to prey on the Hella matchup. Like, they are there to farm that deck because their output is higher and because Hella trades the fact that it can't be interacted with for the fact that it can't interact with you. So you end up in a situation where you're playing Hella, your opponent is playing Living Tribunal, and you just lose. Or you're in a situation where you're playing Hella, your opponent is playing Mr. Negative, and you just lose. Like, that is the downfall of this deck. And I think that's actually not the worst kind of dynamic to introduce into your metagame. My only real issue with Hella is that there's just not really a one card or even two card answer. You just have to change your deck entirely if you want to have a good matchup into this. That said, there are a lot of decks running around right now that have been like, yeah, sure, I'm just going to farm you. And Hella is still powerful, but definitely has some real predators now. Phoenix Force is a little bit easier to interact with, but not incredibly easy to interact with and not incredibly easy to interact with on the final turn of the game. Armor gives you game into the Nimrod plans, if, as long as you have priority. Cosmo gives you game into that. We've seen Armor and Shuri Kitty. We've seen the ability to play Cosmo out of Loki decks. There are ways to interact with this in a meaningful way. Uh, and that makes it a little bit less dangerous to me in terms of than Hella. It's just like you have to just accept the, the output is pretty much, you know, telegraphed. You can say, all right, well, here's where Boom Boom 1 goes. Here's where Boom Boom 2 goes. I think this deck is what more combo decks should look like. And I realize that may be a little hypocritical. I've complained about Phoenix Force in the past, but I think maybe I just didn't know how good I had it. I apologize to all the Phoenix Force gamers. I think your deck is totally fine. I think this deck is what combo should be. And I think that that is a good thing for the metagame that this is still a playable deck. It is still good. It is a little bit more able to be interacted with than Hella, but it still has a bunch of free wins in it. And it is not going to go as tall as some of the other combo decks, but it still will go tall enough that you should be favored into a wide variety of decks that are just going to be smaller than you. This deck playing Shuri Nimrod is extremely powerful. This deck playing the Phoenix Force plan is extremely powerful. I will say, I have felt like I've lost more games to the Shuri Nimrod stuff than the actual Phoenix Force stuff. That actually just feels more dangerous to me right now. It is a little bit fascinating that this deck has sort of risen from the ashes. I just realized as I said that, that it was about to be a Phoenix joke. I'm sorry. I apologize for even attempting to make that joke. I can do better, I promise. Risen from the ashes like a phoenix to be a real competitor in this metagame, it does end up having like relatively lower pow power output than something like a nut draw from Living Tribunal or Mr. Negative, but the fact that it has two plans in it means that it is relatively more able to pivot, and this deck is able to sort of limp into games thanks to Shuri Nimrod in a meaningful way. Yo Woody took Mr. Negative all the way up to rank number two, and I think that is because Mr. Negative is almost the mid-range of combo. And what I mean by that is if you are a fan of playing mid-range decks, you're generally a fan of like, you know, power allocation, some mild interaction. This deck has that. There are going to be games where you have Shang-Chi, Arnim Zola, and Shang all three lanes, and that's how you win. There are going to be games where you have like null mystique Shang-Chi, and that's how you win. There's going to be games where you null Arnim Zola. There's going to be a bunch of interesting and intricate things that happen. However, they are all predicated on you actually playing Mr. Negative, right? Preferably playing Mr. Negative on turn three. This is a deck that is built to crush other combo decks. That's really what it's trying to do, and also have good game into mid-range when you pull off the Mr. Negative. I would expect when you play a deck like this to have a negative win rate and a positive cube rate. When you are playing a turn three Mr. Negative, you are snapping almost every time. For real, almost every time you are playing a turn three Mr. Negative, snap it. That's my advice to you. You are, and I mean snap it, not on three. I mean snap it like on two. As soon as you see you can play a turn three Mr. Negative, snap it. If you have negative Jane, snap it. Like these are the kind of things where it's like you are going to have to find very specific situations where not snapping that is correct. There are some that exist, but the general heuristic is when you are doing this, you're gonna win. So make sure you take full advantage. As should not be particularly surprising, we have not seen a lot of Enchantress throughout the current meta report so far. There is not going to be a lot on the back end either. When there is not a lot of Enchantress, and not a lot of Mobius, and a lot of combo decks, it can be very rewarding to just play the Living Tribunal and just beat every combo deck when you draw the right way. That's pretty much what this deck is trying to do. It's saying, look, 
I am a little bit more consistent than you because of a variety of reasons, most of which include, you know, Jubilee Iron Lad, right? I get to look deeper in my deck than the other combo decks. When I look deeper in my deck, my full power is higher than the other combo decks. So not only am I more consistent in the heads up, I have a higher ceiling in the heads up, and so I'm going to win the heads up. That's the theory here. And I think that's like a pretty good theory. I'm not gonna lie. I think that's a pretty good theory. If you wanted to just like take a deck and know based on what you're playing against that you're gonna win, you're gonna lose, this is a great deck for that. I think the other thing to think about though is that having lost Zabu, there's not a really great replacement for it in the normal tribunal list, which is why some players have started playing Negative Tribunal. Negative Tribunal kind of looks like this. It was originally pioneered by Hella Enjoyer, and the idea here is basically your output is so opaque and impossible to measure once you've played a Mr. Negative that you're just kind of sitting there and your opponent has absolutely no idea what could happen. They have absolutely no idea. Your range is so high. It could be anything. It could be nothing. But even when it's like really nothing, like your draw after negative is like a tribunal and you're just like, ugh. If you get like an Iron Man that costs zero, like Iron Man that costs zero living tribunal is totally a thing that can win games. Like this is, this is the deck that is just, it's a little bit more variance, but not as much as you'd think. I would say this is the version of living tribunal that I play against the most, that I see the most. It is extremely, of course, vulnerable to Mobius and Mobius. There, that's how Mr. Negative decks go, and even how Living Tribunal decks go. But there's less Mobius, and I think that that means that this deck is a reasonable consideration if you wanted to be a Tribunal gamer. I think if I had to pick one of the two Tribunal decks to play, this one would probably be my recommendation. Destroy is still tooling around. There is nothing per se wrong with playing Destroy. It just tends to be a little bit less consistent than the uh, Angela decks with not actually all that much higher output. You'll notice that I'm attempting to juice the output here by including Arnim Zola. I think Arnim Zola is quite important in a meta as focused around going tall as this one is. Zola Null, Zola Venom, the kind of things that result in the most points output are the way I'd like to play this deck right now. Now, I do think that in those games where you get a Deadpool on one or you get an X-23 on one, you are very much able to compete, and I would say probably favored into a variety of the decks that this metagame has to offer, but you still need to do the right things in those games. You still need to draw the right cards in those games. I feel like Destroy is a very solid deck. I won't try to dissuade anyone from playing it but I do think it has seen better days relative to the metagame than it currently is seeing. I would, I would not go so far as to call this unplayable or bad or anything like that. It has been a better deck before than it is right now. It is still worth mentioning. It is still worth talking about, and it is still a good deck. I just don't know if it is a great deck. Discard, on the other hand, is, a, a, I don't even know if it's the other hand, it's actually the same hand. It's worse than it was, and I think the main thing that Discard has going against it is it's sort of a hybrid between a combo deck and a mid-range deck, right? And we are right now in a metagame where there are two major poles, there's mid-range and there's combo, and then Discard sort of exists like in the middle, and Destroy exists to some degree in the middle too, but it's really apparent with Discard because at least Destroy can be like, all right, I'm running Zola to change my deck up, deal with the metagame. I'm running Shang-Chi to change my deck up, deal with the metagame, Enchantress, whatever. You can do stuff with that. Discard has no ability to customize itself. It is the same list. Like that is the best way to play Discard. You can maybe take out Corvus and Helicarrier and play, you know, Lady Sif and uh, Strong Guy. Like, you could do that, but it's still kind of the same thing. You're not adding interaction to the deck, it's just another way to do points. And that is leaves it in an awkward spot where there are a lot of decks that are doing a similar thing and have a higher point output, right? Like, you are not exactly favored in the heads up once Hella discards that fourth thing, right? Like, you're probably gonna lose to that no matter how good your stuff is. You are not favored in the heads up once Phoenix Force starts doing their thing, right? Like if they have like a Venom Nimrod, you're like kind of looking at that like, I don't know if I can win these lanes. Like you can, you can position yourself such that those lanes are winnable, but your point output isn't high enough to justify the fact that you don't get to run interaction basically. And so I think discard is exactly fine. It's a good, fine deck. You can play it. There's nothing wrong with that. 
I just don't know if I'd ever recommend it over any of the other options we've talked about so far. And that's sort of the issue that it has. Honorable mention number one, Corvus Thanos. The number one player on ladder is actually playing Corvus Thanos right now. I am less high on this as a deck and more high on that person's skill as a player, but you can play it. Like, I, I wouldn't particularly recommend it. Every time I play against it, I'm just like, oh, you know what? I am going to win this matchup. And then they, like, retreat on six. <laughs> like, that's, that's kind of been my experience of playing against this deck, where it's just like, oh, you know, I don't think they do as much as I do here, right? Like, they're in an awkward spot where it's like, they're not as good of a hella deck as the hella decks. They're not exactly going tall enough to beat the combo decks reliably. They can do it some of the time. And they're not mid-ranging to the same degree as the mid-range decks. And so they're in this, like, weird in-between position that you really kind of have to play skill out of. Thanos right now feels like, and you'll have to forgive me for the 10-year-old reference, maybe the 12-year-old reference. There was a really good deck in Magic called Call Blade that was super incredible, uh, like really like archetypal blue-white tempo control deck. And two of the key cards got banned and people still kept playing it, right? But it was a different deck. It was a different kind of thing. And it feels like that deck went from being sort of 55% in every matchup to being 45% in every matchup. And so you still had the even matchup spread so good players could convince themselves that this was worth playing, but it wasn't the same level of payoff for doing what you were doing previously. And I think that that's about what this is. I think that that's about what's happening here, where Thanos goes from a deck that is like, let's say 53% across the board to like 48% across the board and good players can really skill dip out of it. And the better you are, the better this feels. And I guess I would say that I would not personally recommend that people watching this video play Thanos Hella Corvus right now. I don't think it's the optimal way to climb. I think it's very much a deck about skill expression and I think it's very much a deck that I can understand why a really great player would be playing it, but I don't think I would recommend it to others. So this is a deck people are still playing. I don't think it's very good. I think if you wanted to play Sandman in Hella, you just put Sandman in Hella, and doing this Electro stuff is just not really where I'd be at with it, right? After Sandman's change, I just don't think there's really a point to doing this. I would much rather just put Sandman in Hella, not play Electro, be fine with it, right? I totally understand what the appeal of Sandman and Hella is. I just don't think it's worth building around outside of the actual archetype Hella. I think the actual archetype Hella, maybe that's a totally valid thing to do. I know Husky Puppies is doing it, and I actually suggested it the day Sandman got changed to what he is. That said, this is not it. I do not think that people should be playing uh, Electro decks right now. I'm just not really in on Electro in any real way. I would recommend against this. I think it has really poor, <laughs> awkward matchups into a lot of stuff. You're going to win some two cubers where you snap into a Sandman and they weren't expecting it, but I do not like the snap profile of this deck. I do not like the matchup profile of this deck. It's the bare minimum of a deck that exists to get on here, but I am not a fan. I I'm willing to go out on a limb on this one and say I'm just not a fan of how this plays. I don't think it's solving the right problems. I do think that current Sandman is an extremely interesting card. I just don't think this is the right way to do it. I pulled this list on untapped and had a pretty good run with it. And I think I've seen it enough around that it should be talked about. This is like a baseline mill deck. And the idea here is you just mill your combo opponents away. And hopefully you also have like Professor X stuff to deal with Hella. It's like very metagamed against these combo decks. Like this is a deck that like, you know, Living Tribunal has some real trouble with this. You ever play a Baron Zemo after your opponent plays a Mr. Negative? Because I have, I have pulled a 0-5 Iron Man, right? Like that kind of stuff. This is a deck that's very metagamed against combo. But the one thing it really has going for it outside of being metagamed against combo is that it actually just has a totally reasonable number of points. Like it's not gonna necessarily be better at doing points than an Angela deck that is fully popping off. But it has a very reasonable amount of points. That said, whenever I play against this deck with like a mid-rangey Angela deck, I do feel like it's it's a very annoying game, but I almost always win it. And so like that is sort of the downfall it has. If I had to describe this deck, it's a deck that is aimed at combo decks, has a relatively weaker mid-range matchup, but it's not as bad as you think, I think is the main thing. 
it looks like it'd be like, oh, this is terrible. It's not as bad as you think in those matchups because like just baseline, there's a lot of points in this deck. There's just a lot of legitimately large units in this list. You can win games on points in a real way and you can also like get rid of all of, like the garbage in your opponent's like living tribunal deck, right? Like, you can also do that. I got a comment recently that someone asked like, hey KM, is part of the reason why you talk about Hella the way you do because you don't, like you you like that decks have skill expression and Hella has limited skill expression. And I think that's not really a huge part of it. It's more about like what it forces me to do to beat it. And here is an example of what Hella forces you to do if you wanna beat it. Like you have to just be like, all right, I wanna play a completely different deck, right? And this completely different deck is a debris-based deck that I recently did a video on. So far, the numbers on Untapped actually look very promising. This is like a deck that had, I think, 440 games in top 10% infinite at the time of making this video with a 55% win rate, a positive cube rate. I'm happy with that. I really am. And I think that this deck is a legitimate deck you can legitimately play. It's in the honorable mentions because I don't know if it holds up at the very highest levels, but like you can play against this, you can play with it. It is a thing you will see. It is a real and good deck. And I think most importantly, I am waiting for White Widow for this deck with bated breath because one of the big weaknesses this deck has is it doesn't have like staple, awesome, big, dope shit to play. Like it just, there's you gotta like play some mediocre cards to make this plan work. White Widow is a card that goes with this plan and is awesome. And that kind of thing really makes me excited for the future of this list. Final honorable mention is everyone's best friend, Butt Slot. And I think one of the things that really helps this deck stand out is that it's a deck that naturally runs Mobius. And naturally running Mobius gives you just good matchups and like randomly into stuff, right? You just like naturally have a good matchup into Living Tribunal. You naturally have a good matchup into Mr. Negative. You naturally have a good matchup into Negative Tribunal. You naturally have a good matchup into Loki. You just like, randomly have these good matchups for a card that you want to run anyway. And I think that one of the things that really sticks out about the Angela core is it takes up a lot of space in your deck. Like there's a lot of oxygen being devoted to that stuff. So you have limited spaces for tech. So when you find a deck where the tech is part of your main game plan, that gives you a legitimate edge, right? Like because you are not an Angela deck, because you are able to be competing with them on points and drag them down to your level with Valkyrie, you are a deck that just sort of like randomly has good matchups. This is a deck that has a very different matchup spread than most, right? Like you have Valkyrie, you absolutely crush Phoenix Force and you have Valkyrie. You absolutely get demolished by Living Tribunal though because they play the card Magic. Mobius helps, but it'll help a lot more against Negative Tribunal than it will against Basic Tribunal. It is a good card, but it's not good enough to get you over the top. However, it's a much better matchup than if you were a deck that was not playing Mobius, right? Like if you had to choose one deck to play in the Living Tribunal, this or one of the other ones that has no interaction for it, you take this one every time, even though the matchup isn't that great because it's better, right? And that gives it just like a very awkward and different matchup spread. I would, to use an MMA analogy, this is like a fighter who like strikes awkwardly. This is not someone who like does the perfect form, perfect thing. This is like, where are the fists coming from? It's odd. This is the Bobby Green of Marvel Snap. All right, y'all. I hope you enjoyed that video. It was, I think, the most decks I've ever put in one of these. And I think that's a real testament to just how open the Marvel Snap metagame is right now. There's so much you can do. It is polarized around these two sort of poles of Angela decks and combo decks but there's a lot of variety in those camps. And even outside of those camps, because the poles are so clear, you can say, I'm going to build to beat those poles. It's a good metagame for rogue deck builders. Like, you know what you're gonna run up against. You got, you like, you have a very real understanding of like, decks are gonna be kind of like this that I play against. Like when your opponent plays Angela, you have a good read on what they're doing most of the time. You don't know what the specifics are, but you're like, okay, I know what the general shape of this matchup is because the general shape of a lot of Angela decks is similar and the general shape of a lot of combo decks is similar. And I think that means that this is a, I hesitate to say it, 
This is a really fun metagame. <laughs> this is a really good metagame. I don't, I don't want people to get mad at me in the comments. I, I don't like being like, oh, wow, this is really good because people are like, Cam, you shill. You absolute shill. You got paid 2,000 gold to say that. And it's like, you know, I've said metagames are bad before, but legitimately the only quibble I have with this one is that Hella exists, and I'll probably always have that quibble. That's really just something I have to deal with, right? And so other than that, I mean, I think this is honestly just phenomenal. There's so many decks you can play. And while they are a little bit, you know, concentrated in two main areas, that's not the only things you can do. Even I've been brewing, and that is not always a thing that I do. It's, it's a very metagame that gets your juices flowing. It really does. Thank you so much for making it this far in the video. I've been KM Best. You just got the longest KM boost of all time. Thank you so much. You've been phenomenal. I'll see you in the next one.